The United States Constitution sets out a dual role for Congress. One role is that of the people's representative. Congress is principally responsible as a branch of government for representing the will of the people, for serving as the agents of the people. Congress is elected by the people in part to ensure that local perspectives and local views are presented in the National Assembly and that the voice of the people is heard in the national government. As such, in fulfilling this role, one of the things Congress does is help to ensure that government is held accountable to the people. So it's a very important role. Another role is that of legislator. The Constitution vests the legislative power in the Congress and thus Congress is the body principally responsible for the making of law. In this capacity, Congress has an important task. It's responsible for such things as establishing a tax policy, providing for the common defense, establishing the civil liberties of citizens, and ensuring that the law serves the interests of the people. The Constitution thus casts Congress in an important role. On the one hand, it says that Congress is essential to representative democracy. And on another, it says that Congress is essential to the rule of law, two of the central pillars of any form of representative government. The basic roles in this simple summary gives you some idea of how important Congress is as an institution and of the role that it plays in representative democracy in America. How a legislature is organized, how it is designed to act, what functions it serves, or what give character to a representative democracy. And as a result, I thought I'd talk to you this morning about some of the origins of the American Congress as part of this series that you will hear from scholars during the course of uh, the next few days. The presentations that will be given at this uh, institute are such that you will basically have a series of presentations that provide you with all of the basic information that every high school student needs to know about representative democracy in America. We will cover the origins, the development, contemporary issues involved in representative government so that you have a clear and broad understanding of what the basic issues are and of what the basic knowledge is that needs to be obtained uh, by any student who's going to be a citizen in the United States. This morning, what I want to do is begin by looking at some of the philosophical and historical foundations of a representative assembly, and in particular, look at a couple of questions that I think uh, are most important. First, what were some of the central ideas that formed the foundation of our idea of a representative legislator? Where did they come from? Where are some of the central philosophical notions of representative democracy to be found? Second, one question that students always ask me, why does Congress come first in the Constitution? What is it about the legislature that gives it a sort of preeminence amongst the institutions in a representative government? Third, what were the issues that led to the particular structure and design of the Congress? And how did the framers of the Constitution relate these features to the purposes of representative government? Because one of the things we have to explain as we think about the Congress is how is this institution crafted? How was it designed and why was that particular design chosen? Now in addressing these questions, we could delve deep into our philosophical and historical traditions. Uh, the roots of the United States Congress can be traced back to the classical republics of Greece and Rome, to the writings of the Greek philosopher Aristotle, the Roman statesman Cicero, uh, we can even trace them back to the ancient confederacies in the early European republics like Geneva and Venice. Uh, these ancient confederacies and republics were studied by James Madison and others as they started to frame their thinking uh, in advance of the Constitutional Convention, looking for ideas from the past or the lessons of the past that might help them to create a better form of government. In particular, I think the most immediate effect, and the one I'd like to focus on uh, in terms of this morning's talk, is the Enlightenment philosophy of the late 17th and 18th centuries, which had a seminal influence on the founding fathers in their thinking, had an important influence on the crafting of uh, the American political tradition, particularly in the writings of people like John Locke, David Hume, 
uh, William Blackstone, the English legal jurist, and of course the Baron de Montesquieu, the French nobleman who wrote the famous Spirit of the Laws, which was so influential to some of the thinking in the 18th century. These thinkers wrote in opposition to monarchy. They wrote in opposition to what they considered to be the tyrannical power of the crown. They wrote in opposition to what was considered the foundation of most governments at that time, the notion of divine right and hereditary rule. And thus they sought a new foundation for government. They sought new ideas about what the purpose of government should be and new conceptions of how to frame governments in order that the people's liberties would be protected. In this regard, these Enlightenment thinkers were a very powerful influence on our political tradition. And in particular, I'd just like to highlight for a moment John Locke, who I think was one of the most influential. Locke, in his second treatise of government, written in the 1680s, sets forth a new theory of government and the foundations of government that was based on notions of individual rights, popular consent, and limits on government authority. Locke, at the time, seeking to provide some alternative foundation for government and some better understanding of why governments were formed in the first place, uh, began to think about what were individuals like before there was government, or what would life be like without government, to try to get back to the roots of why people might have formed governments in the first place. In Locke's view, these individuals were all born free and equal. They were all individuals with, by nature, certain natural rights, certain natural liberties, including the right to preserve themselves, which was best fulfilled by pursuing what he considered the right to life, liberty, and property. Locke felt that these individuals, without government, freely pursued their own rights. They did what they thought was in their best interest. They sought in the best way they could to provide for their own life and property and needs. But one of the problems that they encountered was that even though they were rational and reasonable human beings, they tended to reason differently. They tended to experience different passions. They tended to have different experiences in life. They tended, for the most part, to pursue their own interests as they understood them, which often led many of them to pursue selfish interests. As a result, there was no agreement on what constituted a violation of rights. There was no agreement on what an individual had a right to own or use. And as a result, Locke argued, you started to have conflict, with some people even resorting to violent means to try to get what they want. As a result, there was a need for some common set of rules. There was a need for some authority who could help ensure that individuals could pursue their rights and liberties without having to worry about the insecurity of someone coming along and taking what they thought was theirs. As a result, Locke argued, individuals freely chose government. They essentially contracted with each other, agreed to set up a central authority that would provide a common set of rules, that would be applicable to all and would be enforced by a central authority so that individuals could enjoy their liberties. As a result, Locke argued the purpose of government was to protect individual rights. And government was based not on some notion of hereditary rule or some notion of divine right. Government was based on the popular consent of the people. People chose the governments that they lived under and they had a role in ensuring that that government represented their interests. As a result, Locke believed that the first and most important thing to be done when you form a government is to form a legislature, a representative assembly that would be based on majority rule, that would decide the laws that would govern everyone in a society. In Locke's view, the legislature was the supreme power because it was the legislature that was responsible for providing rule of law. And it was rule of law that was responsible for the task of protecting individual rights. As a result, Locke argued that the first and fundamental positive law of all commonwealths, the first thing to be done by individuals seeking to form a government, was to form the legislative power. That, he believed, was the first and fundamental positive law of government.
That's why Congress comes first. Congress is the fundamental institution because Congress is the body that's responsible for making laws. It is the body that is responsible for establishing the rule of law that is the key to protecting individual liberties. And that's why the framers of the Constitution saw the legislative branch to be so important and why there was so much discussion of the legislative branch in the Constitutional Convention. If we look at the recorded debates, what we would find is that over half of the recorded uh, debates about the convention relate to the Congress. And one of the reasons why that was the case was because there were so many issues to resolve. There were so many questions that had to be answered in framing a new legislative assembly that would be appropriate to the new nation. What were some of the issues that had to be addressed? What were some of the questions that had to be answered? One question that had to be answered was, what is the appropriate basis for representation? Okay. One theory at the time, and some of those involved in the constitutional debates, argued that Congress should represent the people's interests. And therefore, Congress should be representative of the people and be based on population. As many of you are aware, this was an argument that tended to be favored by many of the representatives of the large states, such as Massachusetts, Virginia, and Pennsylvania, for they saw that this would provide them with greater representation in the national legislature. Others argued that we are all equal, and therefore representation in the Congress should be equal, and should be equally represented on the basis of states. With each state equally represented, as was the case under the national government formed by the Articles of Confederation, which the Constitutional Convention was seeking to replace. This debate was ultimately resolved through a compromise. The delegates found a solution in the creation of a bicameral legislature, a legislature consisting of two houses, with the lower house, the House of Representatives, representing the people and being elected directly by the people and based on population, and the upper chamber, the Senate, based on equal representation of the states, with each state receiving two members of the Senate. This compromise, known as the Great Compromise, because it handled the great issue of representation, or the Connecticut Compromise, for those who promoted it in the, con in the uh, Constitutional Convention, uh, was one of the central features that eventually led to the success of the Philadelphia Convention. But it was only one of a number of issues that had to be addressed. A second issue that had to be confronted before we could frame a national legislature was how to encourage representation that would promote the national interest above selfish or more local interests. Or as it was often described, how do you have democracy yet avoid the excesses of democracy? Avoid the problem of faction? Avoid a legislature that would pursue its own selfish interests rather than the interests of the people as a whole? One of the experiences that we had during uh, the period leading up to the Constitutional Convention was that of the state legislatures, which tended to have very short terms of office because the idea was you had to keep the people close. You had to keep the legislature in check. And thus, 10 states had annual elections. Two states had elections every six months, a six-month term of office. And one, South Carolina, had a two-year term of office. This showed that there was a problem. Because legislatures kept too close to the people, always up for re-election, tended to simply want to do what the people wanted. They tended to respond to the popular passions of the moment. They ran the risk of legislatures that simply did what the people wanted rather than what might necessarily be best for the public interest. They ran the risk of having majorities who passed laws that favored the majority and thus ran the risk of violating the rights of the minority. It led to legislatures that tended to change constantly, constantly changing policy depending on who was in office, and thus didn't create in the people the sense of importance of the law or a sense of respect for the law that was essential to a free government. As a result, one of the issues that the convention had to cope with was how do you get individuals who will represent the national interests 
not just their own local preferences. And this was part of a broader debate that was going on at the time, a debate over what is the nature of a representative. One theory held that a representative should be a delegate or ambassador for the people that they represent. A representative should be an individual who essentially acts as an agent for the people who elected them, reflecting their views and opinions in the Congress, basically serving as a voice that expressed what the people back home believed or wanted. Uh, as Melanchthon Smith, one of the anti-federalist leaders in the New York Ratifying Convention, uh, said, there needs to be sameness, sameness between the representative and the people back home. What there needed to be was a Congress that basically served as a mirror for all of the local interests found in the different states. Or as Hannah Pitkin, the modern political theorist, has summarized this view, the representative must act in their constituents' interest, and this means that he or she must not normally come into conflict with their wishes. Another theory argued no. The purpose of a representative is to be a trustee of the people. The purpose of a representative is essentially to filter public opinion and make judgments about what's in the best interest of the nation. Because by pursuing what's in the national interest, by pursuing what's in the broader public interest, that is the best way that you represent the interests of a free people. As a result, this argument, which was perhaps best known uh, by the arguments advanced by the British statesman and philosopher Edmund Burke, who argued that he, as a member of parliament, would serve as a trustee, uh, in a famous letter to the electors uh, in Bristol that he wrote back in November 1774, uh, he noted to his constituents that a legislature should be a deliberative assembly of one nation with one interest that of the whole, where not local purposes, not local prejudices ought to guide, but the general good resulting from the general reason of the whole. Burke was eloquent, but not necessarily persuasive uh, after telling his uh, constituents that he was going to serve as a trustee for the common good. Uh, they quickly uh, voted him out of office. <laughs> this highlights the problem of representation. Okay? Every member of Congress has to balance the role in some way of delegate or trustee. The question was, how do you ensure this balance? How do you encourage legislators to think more about the broader public interest? One solution the Constitution came up with was to have regular elections of members of the House in large congressional districts. Uh, this is the argument that Madison made in the famous Federalist Number 10. By having representatives who reflected larger constituencies, you would tend to get individuals of greater merit, individuals of greater civic virtue, who tended to appeal to many different interests, and thus, in order to gain the number of votes needed to be elected, would have to appeal to different interests, just not one selfish interest or faction or group. Okay. This would help to ensure, at a minimum, that Congress consisted of a very diverse group of people, that there would be members from districts that were as widely different as southern Georgia and northern Maine, and thus you would have a group of individuals who could not form a majority unless they were willing to compromise with each other, unless they were willing to deliberate and consider each other's views. And Madison felt that this would help to encourage the type of compromise that would promote something close to the public interest. Others were not so sanguine, and thus they found that the bicameral legislature also provided a solution. By having a second house that would also have to pass any bills that came out of the lower house, you added it at a check on the House of Representatives. If the people's representatives did become subject to some passion of the moment, you could have another body consider the bill and consider whether it was in the public interest. This is what the role of the Senate was originally conceived to be. It would tamper any democratic excesses. As Madison explained, the use of the Senate is to consist in its proceeding with more coolness, with more system, with more wisdom than the popular branch. 
In order to help the Senate perform this function, the framers of the Constitution tried to make it as different from the House as possible, yet still maintain it as a representative assembly. Thus, you see in the Senate individuals who are selected for six-year terms, not just two-year terms, with only one-third elected every two years so that some popular passion of the moment won't lead to a majority in the Senate as it might in the House. The qualifications for office are a little stricter to be a United States senator, hoping that you would get someone who is perhaps older and a bit wiser. Originally, the Senate was selected by the state legislatures, hoping that experienced politicians would select other well-known and experienced politicians who would have the practical ability to be able to serve with distinction or at least who would enjoy the respect of the elected officials of their states. As a result, it was hoped that the Senate would render better judgment and that the Senate would add some stability to a national government. It would form a body that would, after six years, have more knowledge of things like foreign affairs. That's why they ratified treaties. Would have a better understanding of the needs of the nation and of the practice of government, which is why they review presidential appointments and would help to provide some sense of national character that would help lead to a greater sense of respect for rule of law. And, as Roger Sherman of Connecticut noted, it also served one other purpose. It would help to ensure that the interests of the states were represented in the National Assembly, since it would provide representatives of state interests in the laws enacted by the national government. But even election or direct selection didn't necessarily guarantee that Congress would always act in the people's interests or serve as an effective voice of the people. Thus, the framers recognized that auxiliary precautions might be necessary. And they also realized that they needed to confront a third issue, which was, how do you create a legislature that is representative and yet effective, that has the power to do what a national legislature needs to do, yet not give it so much power that it acts tyrannically, like the British Parliament. This was one of the reasons why there was so much discussion of the powers of Congress in the Constitutional Convention, because the power to make law is a very broad and undefined power. We can make law about anything. And the framers understood that you could use the law to violate the people's rights. As a result, the Constitution both empowers Congress by vesting it with the legislative authority and giving it more role in the detail of, legisl uh, of legislation than most any other legislative body at the time, and certainly in this time. If you think about the detailed efforts that take place in Congress in framing legislation, it is a much more active body than you might see in a parliament that's just assembled to decide what an executive or prime minister had presented as the bill the party will endorse. How do you control this power? The framers of the Constitution came up with a number of measures. First, they enumerated the powers of Congress. They listed in Article I of the Constitution the areas in which, uh, in which Congress would have the power to legislate. And they noted also in Article I, Section 9, certain limits on the powers of Congress, making note, for example, that a Congress could not pass ex post facto laws. In order to ensure that Congress would have the power to make laws on those areas important to a national government, but at the same time not have unrestrained ability to make law in any area. By doing this, one of the things that the Constitution did was distinguish between the role of the national legislature and the state legislatures. And what it did was therefore establish what we now know as the principle of federalism. That certain areas of legislative concern are for the national legislature and Congress, others are to be left to the state or local legislatures. And this division of power uh, was implicit in the Constitution and made explicit in the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution, which specifically states that those powers that are not granted to the national government are reserved to the states or the people uh, 
uh, of the United States. Third, the Constitution sets up a system of separation of powers. John Locke in the Second Treatise of Government had noted that you need to separate powers. It's not a good idea to have the body that makes law also be the body that carries out law. And thus he called for a separate executive. Baron de Montesquieu went even further, arguing that there should be a separate judicial branch if you are going to have a government that safeguarded popular liberty. The United States Constitution therefore follows this approach by having the three separate branches with Congress dependent on the executive to carry out the law, responsive to the judiciary and its deliberations, and subject to the review by the judiciary of any law that it makes. In addition, we not only separate the powers, but we set up a very complicated system of checks and balances, where there's actually a system of shared power with each branch of government connected to the other branches of government in some way so that each has a constitutional check on the other. Congress can never act alone. It always has to rely to some extent on the other branches of government to fulfill its responsibilities. Congress is thus a complex institution reflecting the complicated character of representative democracy. Its members are encouraged to be both delegates from their constituencies and trustees of the national interest. It is given broad power to make any laws necessary and proper to its ends, but at the same time, its authority is limited and circumscribed by constitutional checks. It is the fundamental authority in a representative government, but it's forced to share power with the president and be subject to review by the courts at the national level and divide the lawmaking power with the state legislatures that it works with. As a result, we have a Congress that is designed to fulfill its dual role and one that is designed to fulfill its purpose, which is to safeguard the liberties of the people through the rule of law and to serve as the voice of the people in the making of law to ensure that the voice of the people is always heard in the way our nation is governed. Thank you.